Hello and welcome to this midweek uh, Lent one uh, ver uh, sermon. Uh, today we're looking at Luke 22, 14 through 38, and it's the institution of the Lord's Supper. And so today, if you would listen to the, these words from Luke 22, verses 14 through 38. When the hour came, he took his place at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them it could be who would do this? A dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But he said to them, The king of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table, or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves." You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you, just as my Father has conferred on me a kingdom, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, listen! Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the cock will crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. He said to them, when I sent you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? And they said, no, not a thing. And he said to them, but now the one who has a purse must take it, and likewise a bag, and the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you, this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted among the lawless, and indeed what is written about me is being fulfilled. And they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he replied, it is enough. This is the reading of our gospel, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, the artist Rembrandt tried to paint the story of Abraham sacrificing Isaac twice. Twice he tried to help others to see what faith looks like in that very moment. And the first time Rembrandt made a grand painting. This was early in his life when Rembrandt was famous and he had recently moved to Amsterdam and his halls were filled with students and his studio was filled with clients and his painting was over six feet tall and four feet wide and his vision was grand. As we look at the painting, you are struck by the faith of Abraham. Isaac is stretched out on the ground and his chest is bared toward heaven and his back is arched as his father's hand covers his face, pushing his head back to bare his throat. And Rembrandt has painted this hero of faith, larger than life. Abraham's faith and Rembrandt's glory are blended into one. And 20 years later, however, Rembrandt returns to this very story, a different man. He comes as an artist who has, is broken and as a man who is also broken. His wife has died and three of his four children are, uh, have, have passed away and his family life is in ruins and in less than a year he would be declaring bankruptcy. Broke and broken, his picture of faith is very much different. This time the picture was small, an etching about six inches by five inches. And as you look at the etching, Abraham's boldness is 
follow, in following God is hidden. All you see is his love for his child Isaac. Isaac is kneeling alongside Abraham and his head is on his father's knee and Abraham covers Isaac's eyes, hiding him from his death as if th this was his father's last and greatest blessing. Now Rembrandt no longer paints a hero of faith larger than life, but instead he draws a smaller picture, a servant of Yahweh whose service is humble and hidden in love for his son. Now this shows two ways of seeing faith. First, faith mixed with glory, bold and larger than life, or second, faith that's small and weak and humble and hidden in love for the least. Now I open with this contrast because in some ways it captures what is going on in the text that I read you today. Today we are in the upper room and Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples and then he bids them farewell. And in this one small moment when Jesus and his disciples are together, we see two visions of faith. Faith mixed with glory and bold and larger than life. And faith small and humble, hidden in love for the least. The disciples reveal faith mixed with glory, bold and larger than life. Luke tells us that, that a dispute arose among them as to which of them was going to be regarded as the greatest. And while Jesus is predicting his death, they're arguing over who's going to be the greatest. Having spent three years with Jesus, listening to his teachings and seeing him cast out the demons and rule over creation, the disciples are now turning their eyes toward one another to see whose life it is filled with glory. Who is the greatest, they ask. And as Jesus moves toward death, his disciples grasp for life. As Jesus speaks of suffering, his disciples are arguing about glory. They try to rise above the world and rule, and now Luke doesn't give uh, us the specifics of their argument, but, but we don't need to know what it was that was said during this time. We don't really need the words. We know what it sounds like, don't we? Arguments over who's the greatest, we've had them ourselves. Such arguments tend to be common among God's people then and even now. Whether you look at the church in Corinth at large or at an individual congregation, such as uh, the ones that we're a part of, it's not hard to come across division and strife amongst the people of God. God's people are frequently broken up in arguments about gifts and giftedness and greatness, and it happened in Corinth. Here you had a church that was blessed with a multitude of gifts, faith and healing and miraculous powers that could make you stand up on your feet and sing. And in such a place, was there peace? No. God's people were too busy arguing about these gifts and which one was the greatest, trying to see which one would be the greatest. And God's church became divided. As people fought over God's blessings, some followed Paul and some followed Apollos and some uh, followed Peter and the very pastors that God had sent to raise them up and to become tools to help them in their road uh, towards the kingdom of God, Satan had used to divide them. Satan wanted to turn us against one another and he uses God's gifts to do that. He tries to turn our gifts into things that cause us to fight with one another, our confessions of faith, our offerings to God, our service to the church, our witness to the world become ways in which we divide ourselves into little groups, into those who are really committed and those who are not. And he gives us visions of faith mixed with glory, bold and larger than life. Slowly our gifts begin to separate us from, uh, as Satan uses those good things that, it, that God has given us to divide us. And the tragedy of all of this is not the wasted time, not the wasted gifts, not the, the hurt feelings, not the words that, that, that are said in anger, but the real tragedy in all of this is that we end up missing the very thing that God wants us to see, his presence in this place his work of loving service. We find ourselves busy with all the trappings of, uh, uh, of uh, 
life of this disagreement and when right in front of us God is doing the one thing that will bring us into agreement the one thing that can make all of us stand on our feet and sing the one work that is greater than anything that here and in that anyone here has ever known the humble work of his saving grace and service in Jesus we have the true picture of greatness Notice how Jesus responds to his disciples' arguments. Once before, Jesus, the disciples have had this argument about greatness. And when that happened, Jesus took a child and he placed that child in the midst of the disciples. Children, remember, they had very little social status at that time. No one even noticed them much. And yet Jesus interrupted his disciples' grand and glorious visions by asking them to look at this child. That child was easily overlooked and easily forgotten. And, and, but Jesus, to Jesus, he was a little picture of faith. Like Ram, Rembrandt's Abraham holding his son, Jesus held this child and revealed the hidden nature of God's glory. God's glory is a life of embracing and receiving and serving the one who is least in this kingdom. Now, however, Jesus does more. Rather than just place a child in their midst, Jesus claims his disciples as children. When his disciples are arguing over greatness, Jesus reveals faith through humble service to them. He asked his disciples a question. Who is the greater, one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? And the disciples would have agreed that Jesus was the greatest among them, that he was the one that should recline at the table. But Jesus calls attention to his action. He is the one who is serving. Not only has he served them at table, but he is going to serve them as he suffers betrayal and dies on a cross. The creator has come to die for his creatures. Here, hidden in his servant, Service is the greatest gift of God. Jesus radically identifies with that which is least in the world, becoming the crucified one, rejected by the world, by religious leaders, by his disciples, even by his own heavenly Father. And yet in that rejection, he fiercely and faithfully holds on to every last sinner and every last fallen child of God. In his dying, Jesus silences death. And he silences all of the arguments by revealing the radical mercy of God. And as we struggle for glory and seek to make a name for ourselves, Jesus freely gives us the only name that truly matters, a name that he will give up in death. You are a child of God, forgiven of sin and hidden in the embrace of God. God the Father extends his hand over us and gives us his greatest blessing. And he hides us from eternal death by the death of Jesus, his son. God now calls us son and daughters. As children of God, we don't know the future. We don't know the struggles that it might bring. But Jesus wants us to know that the comfort of his service for us in this time Although one will betray him and another will deny him and Satan will divide them and the world will fight against him. Although we too have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, although all of this is true, there is one who comes among us and brings us the true glory of God. Jesus reveals God's glory in his suffering service to his disciples and to us. He comes to fulfill all that God has planned. And he goes to the cross and offers his life that he might come today and offer forgiveness for our sins. We are children of God. And in Jesus, God has brought, his earth, brought us into the kingdom that death, the devil, and all of our petty arguing can never destroy. The world of arguments about greatness has become a place of great service. In Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? God of open doors, open arms, and open conversations, we know deep in our souls that you are forever inviting us in again and again. You invite us to take another step closer, another step deeper, another step further on this journey of faith. 
And so with your invitation in hand, we pray for strength and wisdom. Show us the next right step on this journey, for we are here and you are here, and this is holy ground. May our Lenten journey continue once again, as once again we walk with Christ. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, remembering that you are deeply and personally loved by God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all until we meet again. Amen.